Well, good morning, church. How are we this morning? It's great to be with you um, here, except as I'm looking around, we're not really here together, are we? And it's not really Sunday. In fact, it's Saturday afternoon, and you're probably watching this at home on your couch in your pajamas. Perhaps I might even be sitting down at home in my pajamas watching this. That's sort of a little bit mind blowing for me. It's all a little bit weird, isn't it? You know, it certainly might be a whole lot more convenient meeting together like this, but it shouldn't be. We shouldn't be comfortable. This isn't the norm, and nor should it be. You know, I've recently been thinking about the idea of what it means to be an embodied community, an actual physical community that comes together to worship each week through Uh, through singing, through prayer, through the reading and teaching of Scripture, through participating in communion together and acts of love. And I've been thinking about what that says to the world and what that says to us. You see, the church, when we actually meet together physically, displays inwardly to each other and outwardly to the world the incarnate Christ If people want to know what Jesus looks like, they look to his body, his body gathered. When we are together, we announce that we are Christ's body, his embodied, his tangible community here on earth. And we display to the world that Christ lives here. We also display to the world that humanity matters, so much so that Christ became human and died. You see, Christ didn't die over Zoom or YouTube, or as believed as is believed in, U- uh, in Islam, only appeared to die because really he was far too holy to get his hands dirty on earth. No, Christ became flesh. He got his hands dirty. And because he did that, because he lived and then died our death, we have new life in him. Christ is the incarnation. Christ becomes like us. And when we gather together, we become like him. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and as all the more uh, encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Obviously, we have to meet like this for now, but let's not get too comfortable. Let's not think we've progressed to a new level of spirituality. Let's not think that we've advanced into a new superior faith where we don't actually have to touch hands and get dirty. Rather, let's long and pray for the day when we're back together, plain old meeting, meeting together face to face, displaying to the world Christ's embodied community. Let's look forward to these chairs being filled A day when the preacher is no longer looking at a camera, but we get to see each other face to face. Let's look forward to that day. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we want to thank you. Thank you that even though we are apart, if we call you Lord, we are together. Lord, we long for the day when we are together again in the flesh and we can see each other face to face. And Lord, more than that, We long and hope and pray for the day when we see you in the new heavens and the new earth, in the flesh, and we get to be with you, united fully with you. Lord, we just want to pray today as we look at the book of 1 Corinthians, speak to us, challenge us, encourage us, help us to live lives that are transformed, that are being renewed through the power of your Spirit. Lord, speak to us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, today we're looking at the church in Corinth and Paul's letter, Paul's first letter to that church. 
And so before we go any further, let's read that passage together. It's quite a long one, so just, you know, sit down and, and uh, let's look at it together. Um, it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and we go right through to chapter 2, verse 5. So let's read. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no division among you, but be that you sorry, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. My brothers, what I mean is this that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanus, Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who become to us, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let, no, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstrations of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, I have to admit that the book of 1 Corinthians... Now, both Paul's letters to the Corinthians are great, but I really love 1 Corinthians the most. In fact... I might be as bold as to say that the book of 1 Corinthians is perhaps my most favorite book in the whole Bible. And may I be even more bold to say that 1 Corinthians could be, perhaps, this is just my claim here, the most relevant book for the church in the 21st century. And if not in the 21st century, at least in our current cultural climate. I know that's a bold claim, but let me put forward a little bit my defense. Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians to a church who lives within a culture that is so self-indulgent, so hungry for pleasure and for feeling good, 
a culture that is built on self-centeredness, ambition, and vain conceit. A culture, in fact, that looks a lot like our culture here in Australia, here in the West. And the problem that Paul points out to the Corinthians is that they are being influenced by the culture around them. They're starting to look like that culture, as opposed to the reverse, or the culture, their Christian church culture, influencing the culture around them. Now, it's quite a pertinent message for us as a church today. And so Paul's observations in the letter, or in this letter uh, to the Corinthians, can at times cut pretty close, uh, can come pretty close to home for us. But the beautiful thing with this letter, and the thing that makes it my favorite, and makes it so relevant for today's church, is how the gospel of Jesus, the crucified and risen Messiah, so profoundly and yet so simply speaks to all the problems facing the church. In this letter and in today's passage, Jesus is the answer. Quarreling and division? Jesus. Sexual immorality and problems surrounding marriage? Jesus. Problems about what food is okay to eat and what isn't, about what rules to follow, uh, what rules we need to follow and what ones we need to leave behind? Jesus. Mistreating each other when you gather? Jesus. Do you have weird ideas about the resurrection and the afterlife? Jesus. This letter so beautifully demonstrates that the good news of Jesus is the lens through which everything in life, and I mean everything, is now to be viewed through. Through the good news of Jesus, every aspect of life has been transformed and renewed. Now, I don't know if you've seen this on YouTube before, uh, but there's videos on YouTube of people hearing for the first time after having a cochlear implant or after having cochlear implant surgery. Now, after this message, not now, don't pause the computer and then go off and Google this. But after the message, hop onto YouTube. You're already on YouTube, in fact, so just stay on YouTube and search for people hearing for the first time. I challenge you not to cry, not to tear up, because it is just so beautiful. Imagine being deaf and at best only partially hearing with the help of hearing aids from birth. And even with those hearing aids, not really being able to hear all that well. Perhaps it maybe feels like you've got cotton wool stuffed into your ears and then your hands over your ears. And then imagine you go in for surgery and this special device is implanted just right near your ear. And there's electrodes that go into your cochlea. And then there's just uh, some computer, ink, computer chips that go in just under the skin. And then imagine after that surgery, you come back to the doctor. And the doctor turns on the microphones for the first time. The little microphones pick up all the sound in the room and convert it into electronic pulses that trigger your nerves in the cochlea. You can hear for the first time your mum or dad saying, I love you, or the hum of the fluorescent lights above you. Maybe you can hear the trains outside or the birds in the trees, your brother or your sister in the lounge room playing. Everything has changed. Everything is now different. The world will never be the same again, and it is the most beautiful thing. For Paul, I reckon this is what faith in Jesus is like for him. Your implant has been turned on and now you can hear. Everything is different. The world is no longer the same. The good news of Jesus has opened up a new reality and new life has begun. And so as we jump into today's passage... You can imagine what Paul is thinking when he hears reports of the church in Corinth living in ways that suggest that everything hasn't changed. That, in fact, it's actually business as usual according to their lives before they encountered Christ. 
Why settle for the new technicolored life in Christ when you can have the old black and white life that the world offers? Paul is pretty disappointed. And so we're going to jump around today's passage a bit. And as we look at the problem Paul wants to address, uh, sorry, as we look at the problem that Paul wants to address, and also the solution or the response that Paul gives as he unwraps the gospel and charges the Corinthians to live life differently in light of it. And so what's the problem? What's the problem in today's passage? And um, why is Paul writing to the Corinthians? Well, in verse 11, Paul writes that, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. He's heard from an external, reliable source that there is quarreling and factions within the Corinthian church and that this is the antithesis of the gospel of unity in Christ. Now, an important side note for us, I think, to be aware of here. Chloe is probably from Eph Ephesus and has come to know Paul while he's been living there. Ephesus, by the way, is where Paul is writing the letter of 1 Corinthians. Chloe may, in fact, be a merchant um, who has people traveling from Asia to Greece, uh, buying and selling wares. And perhaps one of these travelers her delivery driver, if you will, has been staying with the church in Corinth on one of their trips and has heard reports while he's been staying there or, you know, observing uh, the issues that the Corinthian church has. Now, Chloe can't be from Corinth because if she is, you would have to assume or conclude that she belongs to the faction that supports Paul. And that, very clearly from what we will read, is exactly the thing that Paul is speaking against. It would completely destroy his arguments against quarreling and faction, factionism, uh, factionalism, that's a big word, quarreling and factions, if he was to be listening to the faction that sided with him over and above, uh, over and above the other factions. It would completely go against what he is preaching against. And so, yes, there's quarreling and there's division in the church, which those from outside of the church have heard and have witnessed. Now, that alone is reason enough for Paul to write a letter to the church. But as we see in verse 12, there is an anti-gospel source to all this quarreling. Let's read verse 11 and 12 together. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each, of, each one of you is saying, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, which is Peter, by the way, or I follow Christ. Now, there's a few things of interest in these verses. The quarreling exists, but it exists because everyone is throwing themselves behind their guy, their champion, so to speak. An important thing to note here is that the church in Corinth and the wider, in the wider Greco-Roman world, philosophy and wisdom and speech-making were big deals. You were considered important if you could speak with eloquence and wisdom. You became famous and well-respected for your words. And so, for instance, when Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 7, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. He was speaking to something that was well known and understood in that part of the world. The Gentiles loved to talk not necessarily because they had anything to say, but rather it provided an opportunity for them to puff themselves up and flutter, or flutter around like peacocks saying, look at me, look at me, look at how important I am. Now, not everyone could be up front. Not everyone could be the famous ones or the elites. But by jumping onto the bandwagon, 
of whoever was the flavor of the day, you could guarantee, if only for a very short while, that your own little bit of status amongst your friends, and uh, you could guarantee, sorry, your own little bit of status uh, amongst your friends and, and your family, you could get your own little slice of the famous and elite pie. I mean, at the end of the day, who doesn't want to feel important and superior to all those around you? I'm sure by now you're beginning to appreciate just how relevant this book is for us in our own culture. Hop onto Facebook and scroll down your feed and it doesn't take long for you to realize that we have our own versions of the speaking halls that littered the Roman world in Paul's day. I follow this person. Well, no, I follow this person. I follow this political party. Well, no, I follow this political party. I like this. I like that. We're an incredible polarized society, an incredibly polarized society. And in fact, we're even willing these days to break relationships with friends and family over the big people that we tie ourselves to. And here's the thing. It's almost like the person that we attach ourselves to isn't actually the issue. They're just the vehicle which we use to elevate ourselves above others. The real issue is the I. I follow Apollos. You follow Apollos? Apollos was so 2019. I follow Paul. Paul? I'm far more superior than you both. I followed Christ. It is this reading that helps us make sense of what Paul is saying and it makes it possible for Paul to argue against someone in this situation who says, I follow Christ. Because even in this context, following Christ is, is to merely use the name of Christ for your own personal gain. Here Christ's name is only really an object which is deployed to puff oneself up and to boast about how superior and how important I am. I follow Christ. Look at me. Look at how impressive I am. Let me boast to you about all my virtues. It is this addiction to boasting and puffing up of oneself that has caused the church in Corinth to begin to tear itself apart. There's not much room, you see, at the top of the stairs or at the top of the platform. By standing on the top, it means someone has to be standing down below. Those on top want to do everything they can to stay there, and those below will do everything they can to get there. You can be sure that destruction will follow. And so how does Paul respond? How does Paul address the problem? Now, if you're sitting on your couches yelling at the TV, it's Jesus, then you'd be right. Not that I'm Jesus here on your TV, but the answer is Jesus. The answer to this problem is Jesus, the Messiah. Now, Paul responds with the good news of Jesus. He puts on his gospel glasses, or more importantly, he perhaps takes his gospel glasses off and gives it to the Corinthian church and says, look at this new reality. Hear like it's the first time you've ever heard. See for the first time like you've never seen before. The cross of Christ is the answer. The cross of Christ. The foolishness of God was the answer. In chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, we read, And when I came to you, brothers, I, oh, sorry, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstrations of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest 
in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All the Greeks were looking for wisdom and for eloquence. And Paul's answer is to talk with fear and trembling about Jesus of Nazareth a criminal from a despised race who had been crucified by the Romans, but raised from the dead by God and who was now Lord of the world, summoning people to be faithful, uh, to be faithfully obedient and trust in him. This wasn't some smart new philosophy or some fancy new way of talking. This was foolishness, plain and simple to the wise and the eloquent, to those who could boast in themselves. This was babbling nonsense. And to the Jews, this was heresy. This was heresy and blasphemy all rolled in together. But to those who believed, this was good news. In verses 23 to 25 of chapter 1, Paul writes this, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In the cross was God's true wisdom at work. This foolishness was shaming the wise. This weakness was shaming the strong. And this insignificance was bringing to nothing the things that were. Everyone in Corinth was trying to puff themselves up, trying to give themselves significance and worth and status. What on the outside may have looked impressive according to the gospel, was just emptiness and bitterness and division. The world's wisdom on offer in Corinth was a short-lived facade compared to the foolishness of the cross. What was on offer to those who believed was new life in Christ. In verses 26 to 31 we read, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human, no human being might boast In the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. These beautiful and profound verses talk about what is ours in Christ, our calling or our salvation or our being in Christ imputes or transfers onto us those things which belong to Christ. Basically, if we're in Christ, what is true of Him is true of us. The wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption become ours in Christ. With all that is on offer in and through Christ, you can hear Paul's frustration. The world has been chasing after all these things. And yet right here is Jesus and new life in him. Why boast in all these other things when you can boast in Jesus? Why chase after all these other things when in Christ you can have so much more? In Christ, we no longer need to worry about who's on the top step. We no longer need to be fighting for status and boasting in ourselves, puffing ourselves up. And it is why in verse 10, 
Paul can, ab- and a- can appeal sorry, to the Corinthians that all of you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You who are in Christ have been given new status. In God's economy, you are now a somebody. Christ has died for you. He has become foolishness for you. So stop chasing after these hollow and empty statuses. The world keeps on peddling these things, but these are not for you. Do not destroy the church because of these things. You are free from all that anxiety, free from all of the real foolishness of the world. Let's boast in Christ. Let's proclaim the foolishness of the cross to the world and to each other as we live in unity with each other because not what I have done, but what Christ has done. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's close and pray. Our loving Father, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Not humanity's wisdom that is just empty and leads us nowhere. But your wisdom that leads to salvation and redemption and sanctification. Lord, to new life. Help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to choose to live life looking through the lens of your cross. Help us not to fall into the traps, the traps that are so easily to, so easy for us to fall into, of saying, I follow this person or I follow this person and destroying uh, relationships along the way. No, Lord, help us to live lives in unity together. Lord, I think about communion and when we break the bread we are breaking your body remembering the body of Christ broken for us Lord when we have these quarrels it seems like we're breaking your body all over again help us not to do that help us to live unified lives because of what you have done on the cross that foolish act is our redemption and our salvation Lord, help us to be your people in this place and in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone.